Father, thank you for this time this morning. We ask you just to, to bless this time. Lord, I ask you just to speak to your people today. Speak to everyone that's watching online. Lord, I ask you just to reveal your truth and your word to hearts. I know there's hurting people right now, Father, that are going to be watching this. Those that have struggled and struggled in their marriages and relationships. Father, I pray that you just speak to each and every individual heart. And I pray that you bring answers today from your word and that you'd move us forward into the things that you have for us in our marriages and in our homes. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. 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 Dylan. This was our wedding dance song. <laughs> I love it. I do want to encourage, though, this isn't just for married couples. This is also for, well, my goodness, if you're not married yet, this is excellent. Um, the next several weeks that we're going to be in this marriage series, this is excellent um, wisdom and, and information advice that will be coming. And then also... You know, maybe you're not married, but you have married people that are in your life or you have relationships, you know, people. And this is just good, good stuff that we've got for no matter where you're at. Amen. 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 We're going to start out. You want me to start? Okay. Um, I'm just going to start out with a couple statistics today. I found some of these to be very interesting. So put up the first one. And this is one that we hear all the time. Um, almost 50% of all marriages in the United States will end in divorce or separation. So that's, that's the statistic that's always thrown out, that half of marriages will not last. But the second statistic is very interesting. However... Barna Group did a whole study on this, and they said married couples that are actively, not just say they, you know, are a Christian or whatever, no, those who are actively involved and connected to their local church, the divorce rate is 27% to 50% lower than those not actively okay, connected say, to a local church. Say it church. again, man. Say it again. Y'all got to listen up. Listen because, up, everybody. Because I've heard for years, I have well, too. the divorce rate in the church is just as high as it is in the world. I've always yeah. heard that. And I thought, well, that's depressing. I'm thinking the church should be getting something right. So if we're the same as the world, then we're just all doomed. But Barna Research came out. They did this big study because, you know, most of America when they did these studies, you know, they, they would identify, you know, yeah, I'm a Christian. But just because somebody identifies as a Christian does not mean that they're actively connected to a local church and following, you know, the, the, so what the Lord has for them and really pursuing the things of God. So those who are actually connected to a local church, those that are actively involved, actively involved you yeah, um, the divorce rate is 27 to 50% lower than those not actively connected to a local church. So I just thought that was a powerful statistic. So those of you that are actively connected, connected and involved in a local church, man, the, the percentage of you making it in your marriage is far greater and higher than those that are not. Amen? So that's, that's encouraging right there. Um, the right, next one, yeah, researchers estimate that 41% of all first, first marriages end in divorce. <laughs> this is depressing. And then 60% of second marriages end in divorce. <laughs> and then 73% of all third marriages Folks, just end stay in married to your first one, okay? You got a way better chance. <laughs> you got a way better chance. Now, again, this is folks that are not actively in church for the most part, yeah. right? And then the hey, average... Because, no, no, let me add, because I actually thought about this last night, Laura. For those that... Now, some of these marriages that ended in divorce, they were not connected to a church. Yeah. Now, you give your heart to the Lord. You start serving the Lord. Yeah. Now, you and your new second, sp yeah. second spouse, you're actively involved in church. That that's statistic doesn't... Around. That's your first in Christ marriage, yeah. right? Uh, so that's different. So for those of you that have gotten remarried and you want to, you know, you're, you're hearing this, you're, you have a 73% or 60% chance to make it. Your chances are 100% if you stay connected to the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. The average first marriage um, ends in divorce, that ends in divorce lasts about eight years. And I've always heard that too, around that seven year mark, that's a pretty big deal to be able to get over that hump. So if you've been married longer than seven, eight years, hey, you're- You got a medal. You're, uh, you're, 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 you're going for it. <laughs> Go ahead and you can high five your spouse. Some of y'all yes. been married. Hey, some of y'all been married seven times seven or more. So you, you get, you get a big award today. And then, uh, 60%, I thought those was interesting. 60% of all divorces involve individuals aged 25 to 39. Wow. So those of us over 40 and those of us that have been married more than That's... eight years, you know, the odds are in our favor here. Th that is super interesting. Laura. Well, that... it's interesting because I mean, that's where you're starting your family you're trying to get financially stable oh, there's God. a lot of challenges a lot you're of getting adjusted you're to being getting married you're changing i mean you're growing there's a lot that happens in that 25 to 39 year old period and so that's why most divorces we've seen uh several younger couples get married and you know those first couple one two three years are the most challenging how many of y'all remember when you were first married those of you that are in here married and those first couple of years are more challenging because you all those things you just said all right that's very interesting so listen to this here's some professions careers professions with the lowest divorce rates so how you many y'all would like to know you might want to go in this profession <laughs> listen to this here's the first one farmers have a 7.63 percent chance of divorce everybody say farmers pretty good odds that's pretty good i love this uh the second one Podiatrist. Yeah. <laughs> I told Laura that they have a 6.81% per, uh, chance of getting a divorce. I thought maybe that's because there's a lot of foot massages going on there. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this is an interesting, uh, good one. Clergy. Woo. Clergy have a 5.61% chance. I think I misquoted the other one. 6.81%. Uh, cler clergy have a 5.61% chance, which I thought was interesting because I thought, Man, you think ministry is tough, but Laura, she's like, no, we're actively engaged in and around the things of God. Amen. And, the, you know, yeah. that really says for something. Here's another one. Um, optometrist. So we got the foot doctor and the eye doctor. So. <laughs> Optometrists have a 4.01% chance of divorce. Optometrists. If you haven't maybe considered pursuing some of these careers, you might want to because your odds of staying married are very, very high. Look for somebody in these professions. Yeah, look for someone. Here's another one. Uh, the last one, which, which has the actual lowest uh, rate of divorce, is an agricultural engineer, <laughs> which has a 1.78% chance of divorce. So we said this, we have an agricultural engineer and... Farmers, we yeah. said if you really if are single and looking to get married, you probably need to go check out this website. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, folks. You're gonna you have a really good chance of making it if you find somebody on farmers uh oh, farmers God. only God. at farmersonly.com. <laughs> All right, praise there the Lord. Go. So um Laura and I, we this this uh series, our purpose uh, just to get serious for a moment, our purpose is uh, not to give worldly advice, okay? I am, Laura will tell you, I am no Dr. Phil, and uh, it ain't happening, folks. We're going to give God's perspective on marriage. And let me tell you this, God created marriage. Yeah. For us to go find marriage help from anyone other than the Lord is just stupid. His word gives us the answers yeah. on how to build a marriage. Uh, so we're, we're kind of building on Matthew 7 uh, towards the end of that chapter. It talks about a wise man. Everybody say a wise man. A wise man. A wise man. Everybody say a wise man. a wise man. Not a wise guy. A wise man builds his house on the word of God. Which is powerful because powerful. I, I think that's why they're able to call him a wise man. It's not because like they know everything, they got everything right, this and that. No, it's just they know enough to build their life upon the word of God. So if you want to be known as a wise man, a wise woman, build your life on the word of God. Yeah, and the thing is, Laura, um, why we build our house on the word is because the scripture says when the storms come. And they'll come. They will be there. Uh, sometimes repeatedly 
the word says, when we build our house on God's word, whenever the storms of life come, our house will still be standing. Yeah. And that is a promise from the Lord. And listen, I know there's many different folks here uh, in the room and those watching online that have had obvious challenges. We all do. But the thing is, God's giving you and I a promise today that if we will build our marriages on his word, then our marriages will work. Now, the other says, the, the, the unwise person, they hear God's word and they don't do it. Yeah. Are you listening? Somebody just got a ring alert. You need to check your <laughs> mailbox. Um, those that do not build their house. Listen, folks, everybody listen. Those who do not build their house on the word of God, their house will fall. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. Jesus said it's like building your house on the sand. When the storms or the waves come, your house will fall. And according to those statistics, Laura, many, many houses fall daily. Yeah. Are you listening? Yeah. But you and I, we could do like Joe McGee said, we can fail proof our marriages. Mm -hmm. We can have a guaranteed 100% success rate in every case. Somebody said, yeah, but it's too late for me. Or yeah, but my spouse doesn't want to change. Oh, we're going to get into that. My spouse doesn't want to change or whatever the case might be. If we follow God's word, our marriages will, will not only survive, but they'll thrive 100% of the time. Somebody say, I received that. I received that. You have a guaranteed, a money back guarantee from the Lord. If you build on his word, you will be successful. Yeah. Amen. So in the coming weeks, we're going to tackle some topics of uh, growth and maturity. It's always an exciting one. Um, one of my favorite, communication or lack of communication. But you see communication. how that was directed towards me? <laughs> See how that was directed uh, towards me? Women maybe communicate too much. Men, not enough. I don't know. But communication, uh, personal responsibility. That's one of my favorites. That's a fun one. And uh, stirring up passion. So uh, those are some of the topics that uh, we'll be hitting on in the next several weeks. But Amen. today, we're really, and we were kind of talking about, you know, which uh, what topic we were going to start with today. And Darren's like, we have to start with, like, numero uno, which is love. Because if you don't start out and base everything on love, God's definition of love, the others really don't matter. And so this, we're going to build today's, we're going to build the next five weeks foundation with the bedrock of love. Amen? Love is, love is it. Everybody say love is it. Love is it. Love is the key. And if, if you don't catch any of the other messages, I hope you do, because I believe they'll help, help and change your life. This message today and these scriptures that we're giving, they will save your marriage. Write them down. They'll be in um, all the scriptures and things that we're going over emails. today. It'll be in the email this week, so you'll be able to check out. So, again, if you don't get our weekly email, make sure. See Rachel. I know they had the number up there, but you can see Rachel afterwards at guest services, and she can help you with that. But all the scriptures will be there because the scriptures that we're going to be sharing today, these are scriptures that you can't just hear today. What did Mark Hankins say the other week? He it. said the increase or the results come from the watering process. So just because you hear these scriptures one time today, that's not good enough. You've got to have them continuously watered on the inside of you. So like this week, what I'm going to do is that the scriptures that we're sharing today, I'll just read over them in the morning. Maybe I'll just take one of them or two of them in the morning. You don't have to do all. Just grab hold of one and just kind of read over it and really allow it to settle on the inside of you. But what am I doing? I'm watering. I'm saturating yeah. myself with those scriptures of love. And I wanted to add something before we get into the scriptures here. I think most people, human beings in general, we're, we don't do anything unless we have to. I don't know if you know that about yourself. You don't do any, you won't change. Uh, it's funny. Somebody will smoke for 60 years. They go to the doctor. They're not going to quit. Their wife has told them to quit this and that a hundred times over the hundred years. And they go to the doctor and said, if you don't quit smoking, you're going to die. What do they do? They quit smoking. Some do. Some don't. But you know what I'm saying? We don't change unless we have to. But the Lord's given you an opportunity today to hear some things that could change your life. Yeah. Uh, but I, we've dealt with a lot of couples over the years. And it's interesting. Uh, sometimes it's like, good God, you're dealing with a bunch of folks with rocks in their head. You know, they just can't seem to get it, get it in that they need to work on stuff and get help and let God help them. So the only time people ever want to change is when, when, when things are falling apart, 
right? Are you listening? Yeah. The Lord's given you an opportunity, all of us, an opportunity to say, you know what? I probably should focus a little bit on this. Uh, it, it, it was said one time they interviewed, uh, did a survey between husbands and wives, and they asked the husband to rate their marriage on a one to 10, 10 being the greatest, you know, and the husband, oh, we got an eight or nine. Well, then they asked the wives and the wives said, yeah, we got a two or three. We, there, we have a, there's sometimes a big, uh, you know, gap between what we feel is good and what actually is. Yeah. Uh, and there could be, you could be in here married and <laughs> some of y'all, you ready to break out the shotgun on your spouse, but you know, they may not even know that. They may not even know that. Uh, so it's good to get ahead of the curve is what I'm trying to say. Amen. To sow into our marriages. Last thing, somebody said one time when they listened to Dave Ramsey or one of the financial guys, Joe McGee, they started working on their finances and they turned things around in their home. Uh, it's the same with marriage. When you actually put something in the tank, it gives you something to work on. And all of our marriages need work. I like that. Amen. I, I, I like that. Over the next five weeks, really kind of focusing our attention on our marriages and, and relationships. And I think, you know, because many of you probably in here are like, well, I got a good marriage. But let's go from good to great. You Somebody, know? Uh, let's not just settle good for good. Great. Let's go to great. Amen. Somebody told me uh, a couple years ago, they said they were married for 15 years or more. And they said they never, neither one, the husband or the wife, never ever raised their voice to one another and they never spoke a harsh word and I looked at them like what planet are you from because <laughs> that is not the normal folks hey you come on you might come by my house and hear a couple shouting matches going on but you know what we all no, we that's get it back our going next door neighbors <laughs> <That's> our... <laughs> anyways forgive me lord <laughs> We got fun people that live in our neighborhood. <laughs> All right. The importance of love. Here we go. We're going to start with some scriptures. Importance of love. Galatians 5.22. I love this. But the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. So those, if you say, I'm born again, Jesus is residing on the inside of me, then there's got to be some fruit. So the fruit of that is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. It goes on. But the first fruit of the Spirit is love. Everybody say love. Love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says this, And now abide faith. Everybody say faith. Faith. It says faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is what? It's love. The greatest of the three eternal things Faith, hope, and love is love. Yeah. Everybody say love. Love. It's the only thing that will remain. Yeah. And then John 13, verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give to you. This is Jesus speaking. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. But I think the key right there is, as I, Jesus, as I have loved you, wow. you also love others. Wow, so good. it's not our definition of love. And actually, let me, let me get into that quickly because there's four, I don't want to harp on this, but I do want to hit on it quickly. There's four types of love, and I'm just briefly going to hit on them. There's Eros love, and actually that's like the lowest, the bottom of the barrel love, but it's all about self-gratification. It's all about gratifying self. It's, it's sexual, physical attraction, but it's the lowest form of love. And, I mean, well, I didn't write it down there. but see, Actually, that's, isn't that interesting? Because the movies, they make Eros, the physical love, the, the highest. The highest, yeah. Come on, have you turned on Q98 lately? Every song, it's either about whiskey or love. Are you listening? But it's about physical, emotional but, love. But Eros, that's subject to change. I mean, you could be attracted, you know, one moment and then the next moment. I mean, that's just, it's up and down. It's not sustainable. It's not <laughs> steady. It's, it's here one day and gone the so, next. You can't build a marriage on that. Somebody was saying they met their soulmate. You know, you, you hear, you've heard that a million times in your life. I thought to myself, I think to myself when I hear people say, I said, yeah, you just give it a year or two. You're going to find out you got your arch enemy living in the bed beside you. Soulmate. Don't give me that soulmate business. There ain't no such thing as a soulmate, okay? 
So Cross Eros it off. is self-gratifying, self-seeking. And then you've got, this one's not uh, normally mentioned, but Stergo, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But that's love between family members. That's limited to family members. So uh, a father and a son, a mother and a daughter. It's that love. It's devotion. That was another word in the that's Greek good. there, devotion. Um, and then we have phileo love. And you've heard this one. But this one... It's, it's based on friendship, but it's based on mutual satisfaction so it can feel disappointment. So if you're not satisfied with somebody or they're not satisfied with you, you can feel disappointment. You can feel let down. But all those, you know, you've got kind of all those, those loves in a marriage. You know, you've got some wow. arrows, you've got some flair, you've got those different ones. But the I, highest... I think you're... I'm sorry. I think you're really on to something with this. Eros. Everybody say Eros. Eros. Which I'm assuming is where we get the word erotic from. Eros. Stergo. Mm -hmm. Family member love. And then phileo. Brotherly love. Those three I have seen you and I operate in towards each other in families, among friends and relatives, etc. Those are the three, I think those are the yes. three loves most human beings know and operate in. They, they yeah. may not obviously know and the, I think the Greek that, words. That would probably, like, that's where you, the world, you know, like the yeah. world's got those oh, three so loves, good. like, you know, in, in their marriage. But if we're going to uh, be set apart from the world, if we're going to look differently, so act good. differently, have different results, we must have the highest form the of love. The fourth one. The fourth yeah. one, the greatest, and that's agape love. But I want to read, um, this was so powerful, Rick Renner said, but well, a short definition of agape love is a love that has no strings attached. No strings attached. And how often... Do we do something, whether it's for a family member, it's somebody we spouse. say we care about, or a spouse, but we're expecting something in return. And then we get hurt, we get disappointed, we feel, you know, all upset if they didn't say thank you, or if they didn't have the, the biggest reaction of, oh, you did that for me? We're looking for something. So then you can kind of rate yourself, like, well, that wasn't agape love. You know, you're saying, I love you, I'm showing my love, you're not showing anything back to me well that's a lower form of love because we're expecting something in return but agape love there's no strings attached but this is what rick renner says this kind of love isn't looking for what it can get but for what it can give wow. in the society we live in today everybody's looking for what they can get well they're not giving this to me so i'm gonna go elsewhere i'm not appreciated because i should be getting this they should be giving me that it's all about me 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 so it says it isn't looking for what it can get but for what it can give when you love with such a pure love that you expect nothing back in return, this is powerful. It is impossible for you to feel hurt or let down by the response of the recipients of your love. So when you don't get that thank you or that appreciation or that, you know, thankfulness, gratification, whatever it may be, and you're, and, and you're okay with it and you're fine and you're not upset, you're not feeling any kind of emotion, then you know, all right, I'm operating in that agape love because I'm not looking for anything in return. It says you don't love them for the purpose of getting something in return. You shower them with love simply because you love them. And so good. You know, I think actually we're much better, those of us who have children here, I feel like we're much better at doing this with our children than we are with our spouses, you know. <laughs> like it's just easier for us to just do something for our child and, you know, just because we love them. And if they don't ever, you know, say thank you or whatever, you know, most times we're, it's, it's still okay because we love them. It doesn't matter. It's unconditional. But then we've got this different set of rules with our spouse, you know, and we do something for our spouse and we expect them, you know, to give us something in return or to be appreciative or whatever the case may be. There's kind of a... Yeah, I think there's a thing with like, I always said to myself, man, you're a, you're a grown behind adult. You know, you should know better. And you know, that's what we say in our head about people that are adults. You think you should be doing this, but you're not. So I'm a, there's a string attached there for me. Yeah. And uh, it's, man, that is, Laura, I'm, you're speaking to me this morning. This is so powerful because the love, the God, everybody say God's love. God's love. See, we're all good. We have the three. 
We have the three. We have those without God. Okay. Yeah. We have those, those without, have God. without God. The world. God. Now listen. Here's That's where the good. world. The world gets it. They call it love. You have to be accepting and this and that. All those fit into the first three categories. All those first. The hu- the human race. We can show that kind of love. Three love. But you can't show God's love, and you don't have God's love until you're born again. Are you, are you listening to me? Somebody said, how come an unsaved person can treat me nicer than a saved person? That's because they can operate in that, those three other loves. Yeah. They can show kindness. They can show yeah. compassion. But that's not, God's love is in a league of its own. Mm-hmm. And we're going to read some scriptures about God's love and actually what it is. But yeah. for a marriage in God, we're talking about building on God's word. For our marriages to be successful, I was going to say this the other earlier. I know a few couples, I, I can think in my mind now, don't worry, I won't call you out by name, uh, but I've, I've been to the, some people's homes over the years and friends and family, and some of us, you know, some that have been saved for 50 years, and you go and you watch the way the husband and the wife treat each other, and they're yelling at each other, they're, they're short with each other, they're, you know, you think in your mind like, my God, how did these people make it 50 or more years? They're... Like I watch the wife, like she's just critical of the husband. Like you never do anything right. You're always this. You're always that. And I thought, my God, these people are saved. But there's no, there's no God's love operating in that home to, the, to a large extent. And you know, that bothers me. That bothers me. Now I've seen young couples that do the same thing. They just, they talk nasty to one another. They, they're back, they're they're basically just tearing each other down. Well, you do this. You, do, you never do such and such. And I thought, that's not love. That's not God's love. But after a while, just continually tearing each other apart, it's going to end in disaster. And because no one wants to be berated, uh, I think sometimes couples that have been together for a long time, they realize, I got nowhere else to go, so they're just stuck so what do they do? They just start filling their heart with other things, uh, other like hobbies and different things where they're not getting the love they want from their spouse. Yeah, I'm talking to somebody right now. You start looking for other ways to, to fulfill that own gap in your life, right? Uh, and, and it's sad because we can give each other God's love, right? And God's love, as we do that, I believe it opens up the door, obviously, for the other areas of love to be strong. Because you, you want those other areas of love. It's, it's natural and human. Laura, years ago, um, she would say, Darren, you never show me love. And she was probably, she was right in the three areas, the human areas of love. I really struggled with that. But Laura would say, you never show me love. And I would always say back, mumbling under my voice, I would, y'all ever do that when your spouse walks out of the room? You say, oh, I've been loving you. What you talking about? You know, you don't know what you're talking about. She can't hear me. And then all of a sudden you hear from the other room, what'd you say? <laughs> I'm like, nothing. I was just talking to myself. Yeah, I'm like, and then she walks out of the room again. I was like, no, I was talking to you. You know, you should have been listening. I said, you know, but I'd say under my breath, I am loving you. Or I would tell her sometimes, I am loving you. You're just looking for the wrong love. Because she, we'll get into it in a second, but it's just powerful, Laura. These things, we can, you summed it up. Here's the God kind of love. Everybody say God's love. God's love. Here's the God kind of love. My objective is to please her, right? This is God's love with no strings attached. The number one challenge that we see in marriage counseling, young, old, it's the spouse, the husband or the wife, they're always saying, they don't do this for me. They don't do that for me. They, the underlying common denominator is me. Me, 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 me. But in God's love, my objective is I want her, I want to please her, I want to do for her, I want to satisfy her, whatever all those words are, she becomes my objective, right? But the, the number one cause, in my opinion, of divorce is it becomes about me. Well, because most people say in divorce, I wasn't getting what I needed. 100%. How many of us have said that in this room? Don't raise your hand. Just keep looking forward if you're married and having challenges. They don't, they don't meet my needs. So, oh my God, folks. This is, again, a number, another reason to get off of Facebook. 
Because I swear, I, wanted to, I just wanted to jump through the phone if I hear one more person say, I'm going to start living for me and pleasing me because that other person didn't do it for me. You know what? Get saved, dude. Get saved and mature because you're not. You're obviously immature, but it sounds so cool, doesn't it? And some of y'all, the devil, you got to watch out because yeah. he'll sow that into your heart. Yeah. It's the beginning. Divorces don't happen overnight. They happen day after day after day. Little thoughts here. Oh, they haven't made me happy. Then you, God forbid, you get around one of your friends that's been married and divorced 18 times, right? And then they say, just leave him. He's no good anyway. That's how the devil works. And then you go to work, and then you got a little, little thing over there at work that says, oh, I'm sorry your wife's been treating you so bad. Maybe we should go have some coffee together later. She didn't say it in the Adam Sandler voice, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry your wife treats you so badly. I would treat you much better than that. Boom, a seed. That's how the devil works. Hello? Yeah. But see, when, we're, when our goal is not to just, I, she better treat me better. No, the love of God says... I'm going to treat her like a queen, whether she does anything for me or not. It's dangerous when you get over and that self, well, self-pity really is what it is. Because then you're like focusing, all you're doing is focusing then on your spouse's faults. Well, they're not doing this for me. They've not met this need. They've not met this expectation. And so you can't even see any of the good things. Like all you've done is you've just zoned in and honed in on every, you're nitpicking. And then those little things, it's like you got the magnifying glass out. And now all of a sudden, they, you know, it, they're amplified into such a greater magnitude. Have you ever done that? Yes. <laughs> Have you ever done that? The song, um, Love, Love Will Keep Us Together. Yeah, that song. I thought, you know what? I'm like, that is true. That is true. The agape kind of love. I thought, love will keep us together through anything, no matter the challenge, no matter the storm, no matter the tragedy, no matter the circumstance, all of those things, as long as it's the agape kind of love that you're operating in. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth, the famous evangelist, you know, one of the most powerful men in the last 150 years, he said, you know, he, he was an unsaved, unregenerate man. His wife was saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. And he would come home, and he was a, really a terrible man. And he would come home if his wife didn't have everything perfect, the breakfast ready, whatever. He would take her. One night, he took her, pushed her outside of the house, locked the door, and made her sleep on the, made her sleep. She slept on the front porch. He said he got up in the morning, went up, opened the front door, looked out. She's still there. She didn't say a word. She got up. When it, some of y'all said you'd grab a frying pan, smack somebody upside the head. She went in. She made him breakfast, didn't say a word, and then he left for work. She knew the love of God. And you know what's an interesting story? The love of God caused Smith Wigglesworth to become born again by the love that she showed him when he didn't deserve it. Oh, that's good there. The love that is shown, God's love can only show love when it's undeserved. And it doesn't matter if it's deserved That's or not. Right. God, how many of for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? God loves us, Romans 5, 8, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's, That's the love of God. When you do things for people or do things in circumstances where there is no cause for repayment or recompense, you're not yeah. getting anything. So all this stuff in the world, you need to do something for me. You need, I need this. You're giving me this. I, I deserve this. Well, if I start hearing somebody that says, I deserve, you better know that there's either an unsaved person or a very carnal Christian. They have not developed in the love of God because the love says, I'm here to serve you. Yeah. I'm here. I'm here to serve. Everybody say, I'm here to serve you. To serve Amen. You. Praise the Lord. Well, get it. Let's get into these, the these verses. The fruit a couple of love. So here's the fruit of love. First Corinthians chapter 13 verses four through eight. And I kind of put on the side here. I'm like, this is a true definition of love. You know, man, the world, they'll this give you, love. they'll give you an, a definition of love, but this is the true definition of love. And we're going to get into many different translations, but it says love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's God's love. That's the true definition of agape love. And before we read the other translations, Romans 5, 5 says, 
for those of us that are saved, yeah. this love that Laura just read, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, we have this yeah. love. So you can do it. The reason Christians don't show this love to their spouse or others is because they're immature. They haven't grown. They haven't grown spiritually because this is a fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Love is a fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Fruit can grow. That's it. So if you're having a hard yeah. time with this, with love, just know today you can grow. Yeah. You can grow in this. You can you become stronger. You may have grown like in other areas, you know, with Galatians 5.22. I mean, you, you may, uh, you know, you got faithfulness going on. You got joy or peace going on, but maybe you really struggle with the kindness or the love. So you can grow in these different fruits, which is Everybody say, I can grow. I can grow. Go ahead. Amen. So love suffers long. Um, this is a, yeah, you've got it up there. This is a little definition of it here. Um, it's pa patient endurance under provocation. So, oh, that just is powerful. Love Why suffering Why don't you tell long. everybody out there how good I do this? <laughs> you actually are really good at this. <laughs> I am not so much. But love suffering long is patient endurance under provocation. So, you're, it's, it's when maybe things are starting to escalate or maybe somebody's kind of coming after you or they're ripping into you or whatever the case may be. Your response when it's patient endurance that right there is suffering long. Love suffering long. I love that under provocation. Uh, that means when someone's coming and provoking you, yeah. they're trying to pull they're you picking in. A fight. Yeah, they're picking, picking a, fight. a fight. They're provoking you and pulling you in intentionally or unintentionally. Love is patient, it has patient endurance while word. being provoked. Uh, Hello. You ever have somebody, husbands and wives, y'all yeah. ever, you know, one's basically without even realizing This is it, not just spouse. This is, you know, you got people beings. in your life. You're picking a, <laughs> they're picking a fight. Basically, they're coming after you. And you just say, hey, you know, I know the scripture in Proverbs that said a soft answer turns away wrath. Yeah. A soft answer. You know, <laughs> I woke up one night about two or three in the morning, two in the morning probably. I, I was awoken by a large pillow hitting me upside the head. <laughs> and I thought, you know, kind of startled me. I thought, what the heck just happened? You know, I thought I, f I had a dream. I was falling and hit the floor. Well, it was Laura hitting me in the head with a pillow as I sleep. And she said to me, how can you go to sleep while we're fighting? <laughs> I thought, I'm, number one, because I'm tired. And then I said, my next wor words were, can we please finish this in the morning? So she's like, I don't want to wait till the morning. We need to talk about this now, you know. And I'm like, well, we worked it out. <laughs> that and 20 other times, you know. But anyway, I don't even know why I was saying that. But it's interesting. Under provocation. Yeah. Amen. It's patient while being provoked. Yeah. Uh, it <laughs> Love is kind. This is what this means. This is so powerful. Do I become what others need me to be? Or do I demand that the others oh, be so like me? Good. Do I become what others need me to be? Or do I demand oh. what others Say that one more that time. Others be that, like this me? is powerful. Do I become what others need me to be? Or do I demand that others be like oh. me? I was thinking of a real life example between Darren and I. This is this is a twenty year. Hold on, do you need to tell uh, me about we here first? <laughs> Twenty year issue between Darren and I. It's time. I mean, I I am an on time person. I don't work for time. Time works for and me. And I have real issues with people who um, Laura said be on time today for service and I rolled in at ten oh seven. That's because I, I forgot something at home. But that was I my just, excuse this week. Next week it'll be a new excuse. I just really struggle with that, you know, and then I think, well, it's rude, it's you know, it's offensive, you're not respecting me. You, know, you don't have, love me. Yeah, Laura says you don't love me. You, know, you don't show me your love, you know, because you know, time. You know, if, if I say we're gonna leave at a certain time, it's always like 20, 20 minutes later. And I'm sitting in the no, car. No, no, that is a lie. <laughs> That is, I try, folks. I really do try, and I have tried to work you on this. You do try, but the problem is, is he thinks he can get ready in ten minutes. So I'm like, no. I can just, get ready in just ten minutes. Times two. It's it's always times two. Whatever you say, it's going to be five minutes, ten minutes. I'm like, okay. Times it by okay. Two. Now you told me the other day. You said I had nine minutes to get ready, right? And I timed you. And, and how, when did I get in the car? It was like eight minutes and fifty six seconds. Thank you. So. I rest my case. <laughs> I couldn't believe That's it. That's shower, get dressed, everything. Nine I minutes, folks. I'm good at this. That. I gave him props, but 
Anyway, so here, do I, do I become what others need? Okay, do I demand that others be like me? Do I demand that he be like me or the first part of it? Put that back up there, the kind, so people can see it. Or do I become what others need me to be? So perhaps in my case, he needs me to be a little more patient and a little bit more flexible. But I told Darren, I said, no, 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 don't you turn that. No, no, that's not, that's not love. Cause you're, (laughs) see, she's saying, but if (laughs) you're walking in love, you need to change and be on time. So then I said to Laura yesterday, I said, what if I don't change? (laughs) She said, well, then you're not walking in love. I said, what if I don't change? Well, when I'm reading the love is kind, this is what I need to read that I need to give him more patience and be more flexible. But when you are reading this in the morning and you're reading that love is kind and then so then you go, okay, do, am I becoming what my wife needs me to this become? This is powerful. Laura, I just I got it. am I demanding my wife to just deal with it? I just got it. We had this conversation yesterday, and you know what? I just got it. Laura just said, when you read the love, yes. then you're going to see, I need to do better at this because my goal is to please yes. her. Thank you. My goal is to please her. Not for, not, for, not for her to become what I want, but for me to kind of become... What she's asking me, now this has been a 20 year problem. I am not, I'm not, I don't really care much about time, okay? Uh, I am, I'm on time when I need to be for urgent matters for the most part. But somebody said, me and Bella, we're the same. We have, Bella and I have the same thing. So don't call us if your house is on fire, call Laura. Cause she'll get the fire out quick. We'll still be getting around making coffee. The house is on fire. We're making coffee. We're late for something important. We're like going around looking for something else to wear. But anyway, I, I, in love, Laura, I can work on this. Yes. yes. Did y'all hear that? That's, you need to screenshot that if you haven't sc- uh, screenshotted that yet. And, uh, and then you can work on that with your spouse. Maybe there's a couple of areas you say, okay, you take this. I'm, I need to become, br- yes. I need to become work. If, I'm, if my goal is Laura, yes. I need to become. <laughs> We're leaving tomorrow at 12 on the dot for Jacksonville. <laughs> Where's my kids? I'm going to be ready at 1145 or before tomorrow. Bella's like, I don't know about that. Hey, but if my goal is to please her, then you know what? This is absolutely something I should be, be like want to work on, right? It's important to me. Yes. Okay. Moving on. So here's- we got, no, we got this other thing, Laura. This, I'm just going to be honest with you. This stuff drives me crazy, okay? Laura's a perfectionist. I'm not. Well, we go in this room, and I sit in there where I sit most of the day that well, I'm working. Okay, first of all, it's my room. I created, <laughs> I created this space because uh, it's been many things over the years. But I wanted like a nice little office where I could like read and study and meditate and pray. You know, so we've got it looking nice. We have it looking nice. So anyway, there's a throw pillow on there. It's not just a throw pillow. So I sit on the thing and the pillow gives my back support. And when I get up, you know, the pillow looks like I was just leaning on it. It looks horrible. So Laura walks by the room and says, I see you didn't fix the pillow again. (laughs) And I thought, are you kidding me? We're 20 years into this and I got to go around the house and fluff all the pillows. (laughs) And I I tell her like, leave me alone. I don't want to fluff the pillow. Katie, you know? Katie Yannissey came by our house the other day. She was looking around at our house. And then she was about to leave. And she looked at me and she says, is your house always this clean? And I said, yes, it is. And yeah. I had the biggest smile on my face. But here's Paris. the thing. Laura doesn't just drive me crazy. She drives everybody in the house crazy. <laughs> Fia told me the other day, she's like, God, I'm sick of this crap. Mama's always telling me what to do and clean up my room and do this. And that. Well, we went in Fia's room the other a couple of few months ago. We found a sandwich under the bed from like a year ago. So Fia does. <laughs> have to clean her room she does but like i want to tell laura like leave everybody in the planet alone <laughs> we're okay oh hey how about this one last one last one last one laura when we're in the car together we're going parking somewhere and some, i saw this on uh uh not instagram what's the other one tiktok the hu- husband pulls into the thing and the wife's with him and i pull into this spot and laura said why don't you park over there there's a closer spot <laughs> And I said, I didn't want to park there. I saw the spot. She's like, it's closer. I was like, I don't care. We're having this conversation in the car. I was like, I don't care. She's like, well, you should have parked up there. I was like, so it's interesting. The the thing on uh, uh, TikTok said, the husband said, it's interesting. When I'm driving by myself, I never have any problems parking. (laughs) Like, Laura's like, it's 
the spot's closer. I was like, it's 10 feet closer. So we're literally getting in an argument because I didn't take the spot that was 10 feet closer to the store opening. I'm like, leave me alone, you know? But if I'm walking in love, right? I can already be thinking ahead and say, I'm going to find the closest spot. Thank but you. But basically, my strategy is I just pull up to the front of the store and say, baby, I just wanted to let you out here. Then we ain't going to have no parking spot issues. <laughs> so this leads into the next. Um, if you've got the Mark Hankins Love Never Fails book, I meant to bring it. Um, you need to pull that bad boy out. And if you don't have it and you want it, let us know because we can order some more. But it's got tons of different translations of 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, these, and so what we've got here are just some of the translations um, throughout that book. That this next one, and here we go. Love is having patience with imperfect people, because we're all married to imperfect people. So love is having patience with imperfect people. Notice how Laura looks at me when she says <laughs> no, that. We're all married. You're married to an imperfect person. You work with imperfect people. You know, so this isn't just in marriage. You work with imperfect people. So love is having patience with imperfect people. You know, we have little ones in our houses, you know, big ones in our houses. They're not perfect either, but love is having patience with imperfect people. Uh, throw the next one up. Love doesn't demand, you can come on up, Travis. Love doesn't demand others to be like itself. Rather, it is so focused on the needs of others so that it bends over backwards to so become good. what others need it to be. You might want to screenshot that one. That one's not in the book. So, That's so, so powerful. Love does not demand others to be like itself. Rather, are you paying attention this morning? I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is so focused on the needs of others yeah. that it bends over backwards to become what others need. So good. Next one. Love is not irritable or touchy. It's not rough or hostile, but it is graceful under pressure. Wow. Mm. My mother is that. Love is not irritable or touchy. She's rough that. or hostile, but graceful. She is graceful under pressure. I could learn a lot from my mother. <laughs> she is. She's classy. Love is not careless or thoughtless. I love that. These are good, folks. Love this is not is careless or thoughtless. The next one, love, oh, oh, love does not act with rudeness. Mm. Just, you know, maybe instead of reading all three First Corinthians 13, just grab one line and just meditate on That's the one line actually. for the day. And I've done that before. Some of those that kind of speak, because each person, like, you have one that, like, speaks more to you than somebody else. So I grab hold of one of those liners that, like, hits me a little harder, and I'm like, okay, Love does not act with rudeness. Love does not act. Love does not act with rudeness. And you just kind of go throughout your day and you just continuously meditate on that. The next one, love isn't always me first. Love doesn't fly off the handle. Mm. Next one, love does not deliberately engage in actions or speak words that are so sharp they cause an ugly or violent response. That one's powerful. Love does not deliberately engage in actions or... Mm. Speak because words. you may not say something, but you know what you're doing. It's like you're trying to provoke. Well, you get that and, knife in there and stick yeah. it in, and then you move it around. People act like there. they don't know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. When you uh, send that certain text and, and phrase it a certain way, you know what you're doing. You say, oh, or I when you put know. it on I Facebook. <laughs> oh, you know, I was you put actually... it on Facebook. You know, everybody knows you got beef with that person, okay? So you just throwing it up there without their name in there, and it just shows how immature we are, right? I was actually going to post that the other day on Facebook, and not because I was thinking of anything, but I thought if you, the reason you're posting something is because you're wanting a particular person to see it, just stop. Don't do it. And I mean, I, I've not done it, but I have been you so typed close it out, before. Though, huh? I've typed it out just because I want that person to see it, you know, to make sure they know that they're in the wrong and that they need the Lord and all this kind of stuff. And I've just had to delete, delete. It's like the Lord is like, what are you doing? You know, and I just delete it. So yeah, that's a good one. All right. Love, uh, love never nurses its wrath. It doesn't keep it warm. Wow. I, you know, that's powerful. how many before, not now because we're all good now, but how many of you before have nursed an offense? Just keep playing it over and, nursed, over and over and over and over. You nursed a hurt, and it and what will happen? See, I'm 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 having to teach my kids this. You nurse that long enough, it turns into bitterness, uh, 
and that root of bitterness is a nasty you. thing because all of a sudden it's like a weed and it's like it just starts sprouting all over on the inside and it's like those little vines and it just it wraps around everything and it'll just it'll squeeze is what happens don't nurse an offense don't nurse a hurt I don't care how bad they hurt you I don't care what they did to you it's not worth it for your own help for your own benefit you got to let it go that person may have been a hundred percent of the wrong but it does not give you you can't choose what they do to you but you can absolutely choose your response to it amen and it's like for my health my well-being for me to stay in this connection with the Lord I gotta let it go Amen. Um, almost done. Love does not deliberately keep records of wrongs or past mistakes. I know Darren did the funny little joke before, you know, when you get in an argument with your wife, she always gets historical. And the guy's like, you mean hysterical? He's like, no, I mean historical because she brings up, you know, everything in the past. I think 22 years too. ago, you didn't get me a card on Valentine's Day. Then, then, you know, well, then it goes through the years, you know. There was that one Mother's Day. <laughs> I think I've mentioned that a couple times. Laura, but. one time, we, we, it seems like Laura and I have, we've had several episodes over the years, and a few of them have been on my birthday. <laughs> so I'm like, basically by the end of the day, like I'm sitting in a room sulking by myself. <laughs> I'm saying to myself, I'm talking to myself saying, doesn't she know it's my birthday? She ruined my birthday. You know, I'd walk out mumbling, walking right beside past her and say you ruined my birthday again <laughs> like if you want to fight fight on your birthday i think a few years several years back i i was expecting mother's day to be a little grander than it was and then i think i threw in his face i said you just wait till father's day <laughs> i said you're gonna get what you did for me but that's not did love. you did you I, no, I couldn't go through with it. That's not love. And then the last one. Oh, no, last two. Okay, love does not manipulate. Oh, love that, does not manipulate This is situations. good right here. Love does not. Man, I say women, but men too. You can manipulate through tears, through emotions, through fear, oh, all kinds wow. of that. Love does not manipulate situations or scheme and devise methods that will twist situations You can get what you want, advantage. probably. You can yeah. get what you want if you work hard enough yeah. at it, but that's not love. No. And last one, and I love this one. Love protects, love shields, love guards, love covers, love conceals, and love safeguards people from exposure. That's love. Years ago, I'm gonna end with this. Years ago, um, Laura and I first took over the church. We, we were just immature and uh, had a lot of room to grow. And I didn't realize, but uh, we were just having some challenges um, in, in some areas with different folks. and. I didn't realize that Laura, Laura basically, she, Laura's good at like communicating and that she really does let me know how she feels. Uh, you know, sometimes the way that she communicates is not the best. It usually is like an in a knockdown drag out, but I've learned now over 20 years, I'm getting smarter. When Laura, like when the lid blows out, the kettle's boiling, I stop and I listen because then I realize I'm about to realize how big of an idiot I've been over the last couple of weeks or months. When Laura starts blowing a gasket, it's generally not because she's immature. It's generally because I've missed it in about 50 areas and didn't realize it. But uh, in one of these things, she we had it out one night and man, she just let it all out. And I was just the whole time I was blaming her. I'm blaming her for, for, for t I'm telling on myself for about 10 years, our first 10 years of marriage, I blamed Laura for every one of our problems. And I, I was convinced that all of our problems were because of Laura. And then on this, this particular time, Laura came to me and she told me, and I got down on my knees. I went down and laid on the floor, you know, just flat on the floor. I was just crying. I said, Lord, I need help. I don't know what to do here. And basically the Lord impressed on me. He said, you're the problem. And I said, no, no, Lord, Laura's the problem. I know Laura's the problem. You and I both know Laura's the problem. No, the Lord spoke to me and said, you're the problem. And he said, you've been blaming her all these years when all this time you've been the problem. Man, when the Lord spoke to me, Laura, I went up within minutes. I got down on my knees. I know the exact spot where it was, right outside of our upstairs bathroom I got on my knees I reached out my hands and I said I said Laura I am sorry I I didn't realize 
all this time that I had not been shielding you, I've not been protecting you, I've not been covering you. As a matter of fact, I've been doing the opposite and I've been throwing you out to the wolves. Well, I went in after I repented to her, man, I, we, you know, just loved each other and cried. And, you know, God, from that moment, God began to do a work in me because I saw that I was the issue. Now, Laura, like we all, she probably had her issues. issues. <laughs> but after that, I went in and I dealt with some stuff. I went in and, you know, somebody, year, this is years ago, they were talking trash about Laura. And I stood up in the room and I said, you shut your mouth and you stop talking about my wife. I said, that's my wife. We got into this with, you know, family and different things. And I just shut them down. I said, that's my wife. Don't talk about my wife like you are right now. And from then on, I started protecting her and I'm cautious about it. I'm cautious about it because I realize I'm here to shield and protect her. And you know what that is? That's God's love. That's God's love. You don't, you don't need some uh, guy, to, you know, hey, all that stuff, Laura, you know, Laura said, don't buy me flowers, buy me something that'll last longer. I'm gonna throw the flowers in the trash in a week, you know. All that's fine and good. But man, when you step into this God love, Laura, you're literally, your main objective is to protect, shield, cover, talk nicely. You know, just use your, use your words in God's love. You know, talk sweetly to one another. One another. It's important. And if you didn't hear another message about marriage, if you'd apply this, your marriage would be hugely successful. Because God's love is the only way marriages can ever make it. You can't, those other three love, fine. It's fine to have them. But you can't make it without this one. No, there would be no divorce in the world uh, if we walked in this kind of love why some yeah but i had there were somebody the spouse uh went out and had an affair people who walk in love don't go out and have affairs now you may have made mistakes in that area that's all behind us moving forward right the blood of jesus covers us glory to god we're redeemed somebody say i'm redeemed if you made mistakes in your past just you're redeemed get it under the blood and move forward but love's not going to go out and do something that's going to hurt that other person are you listening? Every, amen. Everybody bow your heads. Glory to God. Now, let's just take this moment right now just to look inside your own heart. I believe the Lord's speaking to many people uh, in, in this room, those watching online. Just take a moment. Look inside your own heart and just say, ask the Lord. Like, Lord, have I missed it? Well, you don't need to know. The Holy Spirit's already telling you. You, you have missed it. And that's okay. We all miss it. We all miss it. But just ask the Lord right now. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've been so blind. I'm sorry I haven't treated this gift of God that you've given me with love and respect and kindness. And I'm, I'm sorry that I put myself in front of them. I'm sorry that I put myself uh, ahead of my own children just because I'm selfish. I'm sorry that I keep doing the same thing over and over again, even though I know it hurts my family. Just, just right now, just ask the Lord to forgive you. Just say, Lord, forgive me. I'm starting over right now. The blood of Jesus is going to meet you right there, right now, and he already has. You're forgiven. You're clean. You can start over. And you know what? It's like learning how to ride a bike. You're going to fall over, but guess what? You just get back up and get on there and try it again. That's grace. Grace affords us the opportunity to grow. God's not opposed. He's, he knows you're going to make mistakes. You live in a, a, a fleshly dirt house that's subject to sin and, and failure and all that stuff. But that's why the scripture says, walk in the spirit. We can walk in the fruit of the spirit. We can walk in love. And I want to encourage you as you're given, you're going to give, some of you are going to be given an opportunity to walk in love before you leave this sanctuary. When you get in the car, the devil will come immediately and try to steal this word from your heart. I'll tell you, I, I hate seeing the devil destroy relationships. He gets in there and he just becomes a tornado where he's destroying people. You can stop that by saying, right now, devil, I'm making a decision to walk in love. Glory to God. Now, just some, somebody say this morning, say, I receive the word of the Lord. Say it again. Say, I receive this, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 5.16 says, make the most of every opportunity. So when you have an opportunity to be patient, be patient. When you have an opportunity to be kind, you take it. 
When you have an opportunity to forgive, you forgive. And that's how you grow in the agape love. Homework for this week, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Read it in different translations. Just grab one verse. Grab one phrase. Get uh, Mark Hankins' book out. Highlight different ones. But each day, just grab hold of one of those things, and you'll see love grow in your life. We love you guys. Sunday Night Live tonight, 530. Monday. Some Monday school is tomorrow night, 630. I'm going to be doing a, in between on Monday school, the Spirit of Faith tomorrow. Amen. And then we're going to get into how to be an effective minister the following week. For and next weeks. week, it's all about growth and maturity. Sounds fun, exciting. Fun. See you guys. Be blessed.